Welcome to Jesus and Me, your place to go for Sunday's message from Kingsville Community Church. This Sunday, Pastor Tom Harmon, lead pastor of KCC, shows us that God created the universe and placed us on earth to serve Him in His temple. And now, here's Pastor Tom. So I want to continue in uh, this lineup mini-series, two messages on uh, can the Bible be trusted in the age of science? And we're looking this morning at uh, the Genesis chapter 1. And so we, we want to take a look at that. But before we go into Genesis chapter, uh, chapter 1, uh, I want you to take a look at this little, uh, little clip, and then I'll explain it and how it relates to Genesis chapter 1. Okay, let's take a look. Intrigue and excitement. And even some not quite sure. Calgary's newest families share in a Canadian tradition regardless of their faith. She said, it's a nice day, and again, she's so happy on this day. Calgary Catholic Immigration Society hosting a gift opening for 30 families currently living at their welcome centre. This celebration, a first for many of the children and their parents here. Regardless of their faith, religion and beliefs, we um, throw a party to make sure that the kids uh, that um, come through the house uh, receive a, a gift. And, and I know that a lot of people do not celebrate, but this is something that we try to kind of familiarise the people coming from all over the world with some of the practices that are then here in Canada. They are happy, I'm happy. Okay. I have no problem to celebrate Christmas with, with the people here in Canada. Uh, it's beautiful. It's, uh, uh, the sky uh, is fine. Uh, and uh, ice and the snow uh, very, very much uh, beautiful, wonderful. This family is from Mosul, Iraq, and Christmas is a huge part of their faith. They say it's going to be extra special now that they're finally safe and all together. For him, Christmas is loving, forgiveness. He's so happy to share Christmas with other people and at the same time he's saying that he wish a happy new year to everyone, for all humanity. While there is a sense of peace here and optimism, it's still bittersweet for some. He said that he's smiling now, but from inside he's so sad. He left everything behind. For now, they are embracing the season. Many agree they have received the best gift in the world. I am happy, very, very happy to uh, welcome to uh, Canada. Uh, thank you very much. Jamie Dahl, Global News. So now as we see these refugees that come into Canada, thousands, really tens of thousands of these folks that come from these places in the world and, and they're so thankful to be here because they don't, have to, they don't have to worry, they don't have to live in fear anymore and many of them running and escaping for their for their very lives and they come to our country and they're faced with everything new. Everything they had, they had to leave behind. And so some of the challenges that these people have is, of course, there's a huge language barrier. There's often not enough resources. They don't have any resources. And, and even uh, our, country, our cities like Toronto and Montreal are stretched in, in the amount of refugees that have come into our country in 2018, stretched in their resources. Uh, lack of jobs and proper training for jobs, poor housing, health care needs, prejudices that they will uh, undoubtedly uh, be uh, experiencing in, in, uh, in Canada that some people will have against them. And, and of course the memories and the suffering of family and friends and people back home. And so we, we have refugees with these challenges and, and we, need to, uh, we need to understand when we come to Genesis chapter 1 that Moses is writing Genesis primarily, he's writing to refugees. And, and we need to understand and we need to read Genesis in that context that Moses is writing to refugees. And I think that if we could bring that Genesis, that Exodus today and the refugees of the, the Jewish people, the Hebrew people coming out of Egypt, they would have some of the same stories. Now, their stories would be different in many ways, but they'd have some of the same stories as these people have. How they are running and escaping and we don't have to worry about our children being taken and our, our boys that are being born taken and killed and we don't have to worry about being treated as slaves anymore. And, and, and so, you know, if we, if we take Genesis out of this context, then we really miss the meaning of why God wrote Genesis, why God gave Moses that, 
that book, that, those words to write down. And, you know, people that don't have a context, and they, all they have is pretext. And there's a lot of pretext going on around the, the, the understanding of Genesis chapter 1. It was written to refugees. Hebrews spent 400 years as slaves building temples for the Egyptians' false gods, for the god of the sun, Ra, and for the pharaohs who themselves claimed to be gods. And that's what these people were, were, uh, had in, in their 400 years history. They were pressed into this service as slaves to build these temples. So they, they primarily, in 400 years, their history was that they were, they were the temple builders. That's what they were. That's what they did. And, and, and that's all that they uh, were told that they were good for. The word, very word Hebrew means wanderer, that there's no place for them at all. They're just wanderers. There's no place. There's no home. The Egyptians told them that not only did they not have a place, but their only purpose was to be slaves. When these wanderers, these Hebrews, these refugees came out of Egypt, they had no theology, no scriptures. Uh, Moses hadn't even written any of the, the scriptures in uh, the first five books of the Bible. No priests, no religion. Their identity was in uh, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob 400 years ago. I mean, you think about 400 years, it's hard for us to even understand that because we live in a nation that's so old and ancient. I mean, we're 150 years old as a nation. We don't even know 400 years. And imagine, imagine if our nation spent 150 of its years in slavery. Wouldn't that be awful? Think of what it would be like for 400 years. And all we've got are these stories of these ancestors of ours, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, who were given to wild dreams and strange stories that someday we'd be a great nation. And I want to tell you, at the end of 400 years, when we see these people and Moses comes to them, those promises of being a great nation are more myth than hope. That's, what, that, that's who this is, is written to. And so just like refugees today, these Hebrews were going to be given customs and beliefs and laws and a culture that are completely, completely strange and different to them, and not only to them, but to the rest of the world as well. They would appear as, a, as, as, as crazy or, or different or peculiar people. They left everything behind for this new life. And so you would think that they would have some big questions, and they did. And so when we have it in that context, what Moses is writing to them, he goes back to the very beginning of creation, God does, and he is answering two questions. He is answering the question of, of who God is. This is who I am. Because they had no idea. They didn't even know the name of the God who was calling them out into the wilderness to the mountain to to, to worship them. He, they had no idea. And, and so there's some questions here. And the first one is, this is who God is. This is who I am. And the second question that is just as important is, this is why you're here. This is why I have created you. This is why I am calling you. And so those are the two questions that are answered that God calls them out to and that, that Genesis chapter 1 answers. Now, as we get into this chapter, you know, I'm kind of nervous uh, preaching about on Genesis chapter 1 and, and, and some of Genesis chapter uh, 2 because you don't hear it often in churches, and that's because everybody has their own opinion on Genesis, you know? It's not like anybody was there, so we've all got our own opinion. It's kind of like if you walked out into the parking lot today. I mean, cars are simple. Back in the days when Henry Ford was producing the, the Model T4, you know, you, there was only one model you could choose from. It was a simple choice. And Henry Ford himself, he said, you can have it in any color you want as long as it's black. <laughs> and, but, but today, look what we've done. We, we've made it so complex and interesting. We've got all different sizes and shapes and, and, and colors. And so if you go out in the parking lot, everybody's got their own different, different choice in, 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 in what they want to drive, right? And, and so how do you kind of categorize that? How do you categorize that when everybody has their different choices? And so when we come to Genesis, it's kind of like that. Everybody's kind of got their thing. But we can categorize. There's basically two categories. Just like cars. You know, you, you take cars, you, you can categorize. Like, like these are the ones with high mileage. Like I think of Keith's truck. Right? I, what, how many miles, Keith, are, how many miles are on your truck? Where are you? He's downstairs in the cafe. 
All right, he told me today, I was saying he had 500,000 miles on his, on his Ranger. He has 681,000 kilometers on his Ranger, okay? I, I, I suggest that Ford buy that back from them, put it on a pedestal, and right on that pedestal, 680,000 miles, GM, Chrysler, eat your hearts out. You know what I'm saying? Like, look at this. So, so we have this category of we have old and, and lots of miles, and, and then we have new. Or, or young and, and under 100,000. We got this one's got 10,000 kilometers. This one, this one's got 50,000 kilometers. And, and that's kind of the way people, uh, that's kind of, kind of the, the, the two ideas that people have of creation that believe in the Bible and creation. There's those that say, oh, you know what? The earth is old. It's got 500 million kilometers on. Or actually, it's got 5 billion years on. There's 5 billion years. Now, they get criticized, these folks, because people say, well, you're, not being, you're just not being biblical. I mean, it says six days. I mean, what's so hard to understand about that? Why, what, what are you, why are you going on with 5 billion years? How can you believe that when the Bible says six days? It's just simple. It's clear. You, you just guys just don't believe the Bible. Uh, the, the thing is that, that this understanding uh, of it being like like really old, has gone back even before Jesus and the New Testament that, that Jews, rabbis, used to, used to talk about, you know, is it old or is it young? I don't know, I don't know, what do you think? Anyway, and, and they would have these debates, and, and, and it comes into the early church, that many of the early church fathers didn't, didn't ascribe to six days of creation, Irenaeus, Origen, Augustine, they didn't believe in six days. And yet some of these people died for their faith and were committed to the Lord Jesus Christ and serving him and believed the word of God with all of their heart. And so there's that, there's that group of people that believe, well, it's, you know, it's old, it's really old. And, and then there's this other group, and, and, and that group is, is, they believe that, no, no, it's just really young. They, they're suggesting 6,000 years, 10,000 years, that's all. That the universe was, uh, that's the only... Um, that's how old the universe is. And there's, there's scientists, they call them creation scientists, and, and they take the evidences that, that are used for uh, saying the earth and the world is a billion years old, and they reinterpret that to say, no, it, there's another way of looking at this. It, it can be really young. And I've, I've read a lot of their stuff, and it's really intriguing. It's really, really interesting stuff. And I know that, that there's a number here that, that believe that there's a, a, young, a young universe. And and after all, I mean, that's just what the Bible says, right? I mean, it's, it's very clear, except it's not. It's not. It, it, there, there's challenges there. For instance, Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, it says, In the beginning of God created the heavens and the earth. And, and they'd say, you know what? There's no time there. There's no beginning. There's no, like, morning and evening and the first day or that. There's no days involved. Just God created everything. And, and, and without, you know, there's no time constraints on that. And then in, in, in Genesis chapter 1, verse 2, uh, it doesn't tell us about how God created everything, but how God created the planet Earth to be habitable. And so he did that. Um, and, and so there, there's a difference there. So they point out that. And they point out that there is a, a, a bit of a difference in understanding the, the very word day. That it's, they say, you know, it just doesn't have to be a 24-hour day, like a solar day. The sun wasn't, <laughs> the sun wasn't created until the, the third day, and so how can it be a solar day? And, and they would point out to you that, that day is used over uh, 1,400 times in the Old Testament. It's translated 50 different ways. Yeah, it, the word day, that, that, that little word is translated as time, as life, as today, as age, as forever, as continually, and as perpetually. And, and so you've got all these translations of just, just one little word, day. And, and so it isn't, it isn't that, that clear, really, as, as it would maybe appear to be. Now, now I, I don't have a problem with, with six days. I don't have a problem with that at all. But I'll tell you what I do have a problem with. I have a problem when people say that this book... Uh, is and, and these two chapters are, are a science book. And, and I think when we do that, you know what? We really take it out of context. We miss the fact that this is created, this was created and, and written by, by God, given to Moses, so that the Israelites would understand as refugees who God was and their place and why he has called them. And, and I, it also really bugs me when people who are in science say, well, you see, we've disproved the Bible. No, you haven't disproved anything because the Bible doesn't even answer those questions. It's not a science book. It's a, it's a book that tells us who God is and, and why we're here and our purpose in being here. 
And, and so we need to keep those things, we need to keep those things in balance because we're people that believe that the earth is billions of years old and, and they're Christians, they're not any less Christians or less Bible believing than, than people that believe that the earth is really young and, and just created in six days. We need to, to hold those in balance and realize none of us were really there. And so there's a, there, there's, there's a lot of ways to understand this. Kyle and DeLeach, who are authorities on the Old Testament, write about the creation account in Genesis, and it says that Genesis was written for religious ends, not to gratify curiosity, but to strengthen faith in God, the creator of the whole universe. And so now we're ready to look into Genesis. And we got that all out of the way. Now we're ready to look into Genesis, and we're going to ask ourselves, what is it, God, that you really have to say to us refugees? What was it you were saying to those refugees that you took out of Egypt? who came out with nothing. What was it that you wanted them when they read it? What was it that they saw and they understood when they wrote, when they read Genesis chapter 1 and, and verse 2? And I believe these were written to answer two questions. Who is the creator and what is our purpose and place in his creation? That's it. In other words, my message is simply this, that the message of Genesis chapter 1 is that God created the universe and placed us on the earth to serve him in his temple. And that's very important, in his temple. So let's look at Genesis chapter 1, verses 1 to 5. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless, empty, dark, was over the surface of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters... And God said, let there be light, and there was light. Now, this is an incredible verse. So I just want to pause here just to say this verse is absolutely incredible because now some new uh, versions of the Bible, uh, you'll see that they'll say, and God's blue or, or God's breath was blowing over the, the earth. No, it doesn't really say that in the Hebrew. It, it says that God was there. In the beginning, God was there hoovering over the earth. He was there in his spirit. His spirit was there. God's spirit was there present. And so we see God, the Father, speaking the word. And as he speaks the word, when God speaks his word, it is powerful and it is creative. That God's word creates something out of nothing. It brings power. And then the agent of that creation is the Holy Spirit. So we have chaos. We have all kinds of chaos going on. And God speaks. The word is significant in its creating power, creates something out of nothing through the power of God's spirit that is there present with creation and creating. And we have to wait until we get to the New Testament, where we are, it is revealed that it is the Father who willed creation. It is the Son who created all things as the Word of God. And it is the Holy Spirit's power that brought that all into being. And that's what the Bible teaches us. God creates stuff, everything, out of chaos and brings life where there is no living. God said, let there be light. There was light, and God saw that the light was good, and he separated light from darkness. God called the light day, the darkness night, and there was evening, and there was morning the first day. And then we go into the second day, which, uh, uh, which, is, um, which would be, uh, the second day would be Tuesday. He created the sky, and Wednesday, he creates dry land and vegetables, and Thursday, he creates the sun, the moon, and the stars, and Friday, he creates uh, fish and birds. So on Friday, eat fish or birds. And on, <clears throat> on Sunday, he creates animals, bugs. Okay, I just want to say something here. Like, I, you know, I love God and all that. But, you know, when he created bugs, he didn't have to create so many. Amen? <laughs> and we could have done without mosquitoes. How many are with me on that? No purpose, no reason for mosquitoes whatsoever. But he's God, and maybe he just wanted to leave a little chaos in our camping in order so that he could have some fun and the mosquitoes could have something to eat. All right, he created animals and bugs, and he created humans. And it's quite humbling to know that animals and bugs came before humans, okay? But there's a reason for that. And so we, we, we're going to find that reason. Genesis chapter 1, verse 26. Let's pick it up there. And then God said, let us make mankind in 
Our image. Okay, let's stop there for a minute. Our image. What's this our stuff about? And you know, the word that, God, uh, that, that Moses is using for God is Elohim, which is uh, uh, not a singular word, but, but it is plural. And, and we already see God speaking and the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God, over here down on earth, hovering over the deep. And, and so God is saying to the other members of the Trinity, let us you and me, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, let us together do something together. Let's focus all of our creative energy into making this, this thing here we'll call man, and we'll make man in our own image. He'll be just like us. Wow. That is so powerful. That is amazing. And, and so let, let's go on. He says, let us make man in, in our own image, in our likeness, so that he may rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the sky and over the livestock and the wild animals, over all creation that moves along the ground. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. God, I, I'm not going to even say male and female, he created them because he, he's only ever, you know what? Let, let me just, just take a big step off of this here. And, and just, let, let me just say, I got to say it. I got to say it. Okay? Male and female is not a social construct. God made male and female. He's only making two kinds. All right. I said it. There we go. Let's go on. So, where was I? I see. I can't I get myself excited. I get totally lost. Then God said, give, I give you every bearing, seed bearing plant on the face of the whole earth and every tree that has fruit with seed in it. They will be yours for food. And to all the beasts of the earth and all the birds of the sky and all the creatures that Move along the ground. Thank you. We don't really need those. Everything that, well, we actually do. Everything that has breath of life in it, I give every green plant for food. And so it was. And God saw that he had what he had made, and it was very good. Very good. Let me just make reference to something here. God creates everything. He says, it's good, it's good. But God stands back on the sixth day, and he's made man in his image and placed man in the center in the Garden of Eden. And God stands back. He goes, oh, now that's really good. That's very good. And so on the seventh day, on the seventh day, important day, important day, the heavens and the earth were completed in all of their vast array, by the seventh day, God had finished the work that he had been doing. So on the seventh day, he rested from all of his work. Then God blessed the seventh day and made it holy. So for every day, the first six days, he says, this is good. The, the sixth day, it's very good. But he creates the seventh day and he says, this is holy. This is holy. Very important things that we need to keep in mind. Because of what? Because on it, he rested from the work of creating that he had done. All right, let's look at some of the some of the lessons, some of the things that God is teaching us from Genesis chapter one. And this may be different from what you've heard, because we usually hear it out of context of that we're talking to refugees here who don't know God and have lots of questions. We hear it from this kind of side where we argue science and try to use it as a science book. But we're not going to look at it that way today. We're going to try to read it and understand it the way that these Jews would have understood it as they're coming out of Egypt. Okay, and so the first question it is is who's God? Who's God and what, he's, what is he like? And it, be, it begins with this word Elohim. And Elohim is, again, it's a plural word. And it means that God, not gods, but God, but has, has this plural form to it. We, we don't understand until we actually get to the New Testament. And that this God is the only God. He's the only real God. He's the only true God. Now, you see, the Israelites, they were used to building temples for all of these other gods. And they understood temple building. They were the pyramid builders, the temple builders for 400 years. That's what they did. They were pressed into this slave labor to build these glorious temples that would show forth the glory and the greatness of these gods. And so that's what they did. They understood that when they made temples, they were making them to show forth the glory of that God that the temple was for. And that's how they understood the world. That's all they understood. They were just slaves that built temples. That's it. And the bigger the temple, the greater the God. And so when the Israelites read this account in Genesis chapter 1, they understood it, not like we do today. 
But they read it like God was saying and telling them, this is how I built my temple. I'm going to tell you how I built my temple. And if it was God, like God think, saying to the Israelites, if you think the Egyptians had great and glorious temples of great gods, wait till you see what I did. Wait till you get a look at my temple. And so all through the Old Testament, the Old Testament writers and the Old Testament prophets and the Old Testament po poets, when they looked at creation, they didn't ask, how old is it? Hmm, I wonder if Darwin was right. They rather, they looked at it and they looked at it as if it was God's temple and that God was enthroned above his temple. And that's why temples, see, talk about the glory of God. And God says through the psalmist, Psalm 91, the heavens declare the glory of God. And the firmament, the things that he's made down on earth, it declares the intricacy of his handiwork. They saw all of creation as God's temple, as a place where God had created with his own hands and where he himself would sit enthroned above it. Psalm 58, uh, 78, verse 69 says, And he built his sanctuary, talking about God, like the heights, like the earth, which he founded forever. Here again, God's sanctuary is not the earth. It's not on the earth, but it is higher than the earth. It is in all of the universe. And it's, he built it in the same way he built the earth, and, and, uh, uh, which he founded forever. Isaiah 66, verses 1 to 2. God says, Heaven is my throne. Now, he's not talking about heaven where a bunch of angels are playing harps. He's talking about the heavens when you look out into the night sky and you see all the galaxies and the ever-expanding universe. And he says, you know what? That's my throne and I sit over and I sit above it. It's my temple. It declares my glory. And the earth that I have created, it's my footstool. And so we have this, we have this picture of God resting on his throne in a resting position with his feet out on his footstool saying, I'm resting. I've got myself a cup of coffee from the cafe at KCC and I've got my newspaper and I'm at rest. Heaven is my throne. The earth is my footstool. And then he looks at man, he says, where then will you make a house that you could build for me? Well, the question is rhetorical. You can't. And where is the place that I may rest? Temples are for God. For, for the places where the gods rest. For my hand made all of these things, all of these kings came into being, declares the Lord. So here again, the Israelites' view of Genesis 1, it is the building of God's temple. It is the putting into place of the foundation and all the things of God's temple so that we would know him. And when we would look at what God has made, we would turn our worship towards, towards him. Again, we see this in, te in the temple uh, and, and the tabernacle, seven days of creation. And, and when they went to build the, the tabernacle, it's not a coincidence that it took seven days for the dedication of Aaron and the priesthood in that tabernacle before uh, the ministry and, and of the tabernacle would begin to begin. And at the seventh day, at the next day, they lay out the sacrifices and God shows up in his tabernacle and consumes all of the uh, sacrifices. Where do they get that idea? Why was it seven days? One or five or six or three or 20? Because it goes back to Genesis and they understood that God God is building his temple. And when Solomon sets up the temple, it's seven days. And God comes to rest in his temple. That is God's rest is his presence coming in and him ruling over his people. And so on the seventh day, they lay out the sacrifices and bang, the presence of God shows up. So we see these seven days in Genesis in the pagan temples. Again, our temple, our temple builders and refugees would understand this where we maybe miss it. But they would build the temples and then they'd have a big ceremony. And the very last thing that would be built and placed in the temple, the very last thing that would be set up, the temple was not complete until one thing remained. And until that thing was placed in the temple, the temple was not complete. And until this thing was placed in creation, creation was not complete or in order. But on the sixth day, on the very last thing that God made, God sets up his image in his temple. And that's exactly how they understood that. So God created man. He wasn't going to have an image of stone or wood or creation wasn't going to be in He wasn't going to be in him and, and the creation wasn't going to show forth his image. But God, the Holy Spirit, comes along and they gather together the stones and the, the dirt on the ground and God breathes life 
into that very, very, very pile of dirt. And that dirt becomes men and women. And they are placed in the temple of God as God sets up you and me, men and women, to be his image of him in his temple. And the work is complete. And God looks at it. There's my creation. There's the heavens declaring my glory. And there's men and women right there in my temple, my image in the temple. And this is very, very good. Amen. Wow. Why is it that we are not to set up any image or likeness of God? Because we are that image and likeness, and we are not allowed to give that away to anything created. We're it. You're it. On the seventh day, God then declares that day holy and rests from his created work. John Walton, in his book, The Last World of Genesis, Lost World of Genesis 1, writes, Deity rests in a temple, and only in a temple can a deity rest. That is what temples are built for. And here's what David says. Psalm 20, 132, verses 8 and 9, he says, Arise, O Lord, to your resting place. That's why David wanted to build God a temple, so that he could rest. And God says, you can't build me a temple to rest. I've already built it. I don't live in temples made with hands. Arise, O Lord, to your resting place, you and the ark of your strength. Let your priests be clothed with righteousness, and let your saints show forth your joy. God chose the language of Genesis to help the Israelites who were temple builders and refugees who were coming out of Egypt to understand who he was, that he was the all-powerful God who created the heavens and earth and who built all of creation with his own hands to be his own temple so that when they look up into the stars on a desert night and they see the Milky Way all across the galaxy, and when uh, behind that there's literally billions and billions of other galaxies, that they would look at that and they would hear his voice saying to them, glory to God, that it would call out God's glory. And that's why. That's who he was. That's who they were serving. And that blew their socks off. And then the second question is just as important as the first. Why was man created? And as I can see in Genesis, there are two reasons. One is to be the living image of the, of the invisible God. Jordan Peterson says this is a very strange view of people. There's no other, there's no other, uh, other religion or belief in the world except the monotheistic beliefs, the belief of Judaism, the belief of Christianity, the belief, belief of, of Islam. And I'm not saying those, those religions all believe the same thing, but I'm saying they all come from the same root where they look and they say, man was created in God's image. That's a very, very, very strange idea of people. That people, even at their worst, there is something of divinity in them. God help us if we ever forget that, that all people are equal before God. People, we were made in God's image. We were placed in the very paradise of the Garden of Eden where God would walk with us in the evening of the day. What a beautiful picture that we have at the very beginning that all of this was created as the place where God would dwell, where we would worship him, where we would look up in the night sky and we would hear the heavens and the earth saying, glory to God. And where we would walk with him in the very, very epic center of his temple, enjoying paradise in the presence of Almighty God. The other, the other purpose I see that you and I having is that Adam and Eve were given a priestly purpose. In Genesis chapter 2, verse 15, they are told that God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to tend it and to keep it. And that's the, that, that's the job. That's what priests do. They look after the temple. That's what they do. This is a priestly service that Adam and Eve have. And, and I want you to notice in this that when he gives them this, he gives them great responsibility. This creation, this creation of mine is yours. I'm giving it to you. You better look after it. You better keep it. You better protect it. And boy, have we failed on that one, haven't we? You need to keep it and you protect it. But here's something else that's very important. 
Not only with the responsibility, he gave them responsibility, but he also gave them authority with that responsibility. That's how we work. You know, if somebody gives you responsibility without authority, it really ticks you off, doesn't it? How can I be responsible for this if I don't have any authority over it? When you give your kids responsibilities, folks, make sure you give them some authority with that. Or they'll resent you. When you go to work, and if you have people working with you and you give them responsibilities, you want that to really work really well, give them some authority with it. And so God gives Adam responsibility. He makes him responsible, but he also gives him authority, and that is when he gives him free will. Because without authority, there's no freedom. And there's no will. There's so much in here, isn't there? We're just scratching the surface. All right. There's so much. So four lessons, four takeaways from Genesis chapter 1 and 2. The main message is that we were created by God to serve him in his temple. You were created to love God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. That means that everything you do with your breath and in your life is either worship or service to God. You are a priest of God. And that's what the New Testament teaches, doesn't it? We're all priests. We all serve God. And God looks at our life and doesn't say, oh, well, you're just a priest on Sunday, you know, for one hour. Well, when Pastor Tom's preaching, it's, it's a little bit more than an hour. No, it's every moment, every day, every breath that you take. You are his priest. And you're to serve him and love him with all your heart. And we can do that. We can make a, 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 new, a new start every new year. And really, some of us, you know, we need it all through the new year. The, the other takeaway, another lesson is that the true meaning and purpose in life can only be found in your relationship with God. Through Jesus Christ. He's the one who created you. It was through his word and his power and might that you were created. And in Genesis, we see we've got this very broad picture of the whole cosmos and all of man created to worship and serve God. But it gets narrow as God chooses. Out of that, he, he, choo he, chooses, uh, just, he chooses Seth. And out of that, he chooses Abraham. And out of Abraham, in his line, he chooses David. And then the, the very pinnacle, the very point, it comes to such a minute little place that we just celebrated that in a manger on Christmas, there is that one thing. All of creation has been working to this focal point, and it is all there in a little baby, the Messiah that comes and saves the world from their sins that Adam messed up in the garden. It comes to that very point, and as Jesus lives and dies and rises again, it begins to broaden again. And Jesus says, this isn't just for me. This is, this is for everybody. Go into all of the world and preach the gospel. And it gets broader and broader as more people of every language, of every tongue, of every nation, and every race are to be reached, to be a part of this kingdom. It gets so broad that in the last two, verse, last two chapters of the Bible, we have another creation story. Yeah, we, we have two, two chapters at the beginning of the Bible and the two chapters at the very end of the Bible. We have another creation story. God creates a new heaven and a new earth. And coming down out of heaven is this place, this presence of God called the New Jerusalem, which strangely sounds like a garden with all the precious stones that were in Genesis, with the trees and the fruit and with the tree of life and the healing and the, and the river running through it and the throne of God there. And in the midst of the throne is who? Jesus. And today what God is calling us is saying, he's saying, hey, serve me now in my temple. Give your whole life to me. A third thing that we can take away is this, that God's word and spirit bring order to your chaos. I don't care what your chaos is. It's through the word and the presence of the Holy Spirit, through Jesus and through his power and his spirit. He takes every chaotic situ situation in your life and makes it bare potential. You've got a kid in your house and you think, man, this kid is just chaos walking through the door. I want to tell you that, that God can release the potential and fruitfulness out of that chaos because he's God. So trust him. 
Trust him to bring order and fruitfulness to the chaos. If that chaos is in your marriage, trust him to begin to bring order and fruit into, the, into your marriage. If the chaos is in your health, trust God to break your health, to, for your body to come in order and begin to produce life and fruit from that. If your chaos is in your job, it doesn't matter whether chaos is because we believe that the word has power and the Holy Spirit is present with us. He takes chaos and turns it into order and fruitfulness in our lives. And the very last thing is that all people, regardless of who they are, where they're from, what they believe, what they've done, are equally valued in the presence and the sight of God as people made in his image. Let's stand together as we close this service. We sang a song, How Great Is Our God, and let's worship him, for he created us, and he created us to serve him and worship him in his temple, all of this creation. And let's just sing it and praise him today as we close in, in our, our service here this morning. Bless you. Maybe this morning you need to just come back to him and say, Lord, I, I believe I was created for something more than just this. And Lord, I have a new appreciation. I see that from the very beginning of creation to the very end of the Bible, that there is meaning and there is purpose. And God, you are great. And it all fits together and works together. And I can experience that same creative life that was there in Genesis, that is there at the very end of the Bible. I can create it in my life right now because your presence. So, Lord, I pray that you'd fill us. And, Lord, if there's somebody here that needs to come to you, that they just come in their own way and say, Lord, come into my life. Jesus, forgive my sins and and give me a new start in 2019. Lord, for our church, give us a new breath of life and a wind of your Holy Spirit in 2019. May we be worshipers and exuberant and excited about what God is doing in our midst, even right now. In Jesus' name. And Lord, for those who are in chaos today in an area of their life, that your word and your spirit would come and bring order and fruitfulness into that area, Lord, that just seems so empty and so filled with darkness, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. Have a wonderful week. We hope you enjoyed this week's message. If you would like to know more about our church, visit kingsvillechurch.com. Thanks for tuning in, and don't forget to join us next week.